Unlike their Cleopatra docudrama, Netflix's recent Lost Pyramid documentary has done amazingly well because it focuses on real archaeology. In case you haven't watched it, it's about two teams of archaeologists finding some pretty spectacular things in two sites within the larger ancient necropolis of Saqqara, which is just south of Cairo. One is led by Zahi Hawass, Egypt's controversial former Minister of Antiquities, and another is led by his protege, Mustafa Waziri. Hawass is hell-bent on finding the Lost Pyramid of the ancient Third Dynasty Pharaoh Huni, which is why the documentary is called what it's called, and Waziri is trying to find intact tombs, which he does. Well, luckily they both do, but the documentary left out some pretty important details about where they were digging, what they found, and of course the central theme of the documentary, the Lost Pyramid of Huni, and all the mystery surrounding it. Which gets even deeper, because it's already been identified with plenty of known monuments, which we're gonna look through. Trust me, you'll hear about pyramids today, you'd have never heard about anywhere else. So like and subscribe if you want more videos about ancient Egypt and let's go. The documentary is actually pretty explicit about the odd dynamic between the two main protagonists. Zahi Hawass has dominated Egyptology for decades and just because he's not still the head of antiquities doesn't mean he's not at the top. He still runs his own digs, always promises that he's on the very cusp of making huge new discoveries like finding the tomb of Cleopatra or identifying Nefertiti's mummy, and ads for his tour agency are still plastered on the back covers of every issue of Archaeology Magazine I buy. And of course he still stars in plenty of documentaries. Waziri, on the other hand, was trained by Hawass and worked under him for a long time. And even though he's the acting head of antiquities and he's become more prominent in the past few years, starring in another Netflix documentary a while back, he himself sums up their relationship pretty well when he says in this documentary, Dr. Hawass is like my spiritual father. He's not my boss, but he is my boss. I wish I could actually show you him saying this, but I don't want this video to be removed like the last one I did about Hawass' old reality TV series. So let's talk about where they're actually digging. Hawass is trying to find the Lost Pyramid of Huni at a place called Gisr el Medir in Arabic and the Great Enclosure in English. As you can guess, its main feature is a huge rectangular enclosure wall that's barely elevated above the desert surrounding it now. Its builder and purpose remain unidentified. It makes a lot of sense to look for a third dynasty pyramid here because it's just a few hundred meters southwest of two other third dynasty pyramids. The Pyramid of Djoser, which still dominates the landscape of Saqqara and was the first ever pyramid built in Egypt, period, and the Buried Pyramid of his successor, Sekemket which, as you can guess, was buried under the sand until the 1950s. In fact, I have a feeling that Hawass is trying to follow in the footsteps of the Egyptian archaeologist who discovered that pyramid, Zachariah Goni. He's expressed great admiration for him in the past, especially since he was one of the few prominent native Egyptian archaeologists at a time when Egyptology was almost entirely dominated by non-Egyptians, which Hawass speaks about rectifying, which he arguably did. Anyways, is there any evidence that the Great Enclosure actually holds a buried pyramid? I mean, the poster for the documentary has this hologram step pyramid projected onto empty desert, and it looks a bit silly. But if you look at diagrams of the Buried Pyramid and another Third Dynasty Pyramid, known as the Layer Pyramid, a bit farther north, you'll see that they actually do sort of look like this poster. The mighty step pyramids they would have been are projected onto the stumps of what was finished which wasn't a lot. So no one's actually expecting a full pyramid to just pop out of the ground, although that would be cool, wouldn't it? But what about the Great Enclosure itself? It looks a lot like those rectangular enclosures around the Step Pyramid and the Buried Pyramid, but it's actually thought to just predate the age of the pyramids being from the Second Dynasty, which was deduced from the pottery found within the rubble fill of its walls. That pottery was found when it was first fully investigated by the National Museum of Scotland in the mid-90s, but it's been investigated as far back as 1837 by John Perrick. Hawass himself excavated there in 2009, and he discovered multiple 5th and 6th dynasty tombs, along with a 26th dynasty group burial that is remarkably similar to the one Waziri found in this documentary. 
More recently, he's discovered a bunch of other very well-preserved Old Kingdom tombs here, and although they featured pretty prominently in the news, and I actually did a video on them, the only one of them to be featured in this documentary was the, was the tomb that contained the mummy covered in gold. That's how the media touted it, the oldest known mummy ever covered in gold. Despite Hawass identifying it as the body of a woman named Nebet Hoot, based on the inscription on the lid of her sarcophagus, the media reported that it was a man named Hekeshepes, so I honestly don't know who screwed up there. Hawass is convinced that the presence of these tombs indicates that there must be a pyramid nearby, since courtiers were often buried next to their pharaohs so that they could accompany and serve them in the afterlife. The tombs he found do post-date the reign of Huni in the Third Dynasty, but it still could have been a sacred place for a long time afterwards. I mean, burials have been found there from as late as the Greco-Roman period. But most importantly, at the end of the documentary, his team discovers a truly enormous building that may very well be a pyramid. We don't know yet. There's no telling if it's Huni's pyramid or another pyramid belonging to another member of the Third Dynasty or something else entirely, but who knows? After all, Huni's pyramid has already been identified with five other monuments across Egypt. What makes it worse is that we barely know anything about the guy. The later Third Dynasty is incredibly confusing and enigmatic because later kinglists don't agree on the order of the kings within it or even the number of them. Even the statue head used to portray Huni on Wikipedia and seen several times throughout the documentary and its marketing might not be Huni at all. It's just the head of a statue from around that area. So there's just a chance it's him. All we know for sure about Huni is that he was the last member of the Third Dynasty and that his successor was the great pharaoh Sneferu, who's known for building the first true pyramid in Egypt and fathering the man who built the Great Pyramid, Khufu. Most of the king lists do agree with this, and it's confirmed by the autobiographical inscriptions within the tomb of an official named Metjen, also from Saqqara, and a much later papyrus known as Papyrus Pris, which just happens to mention it in passing. So let's cover all of Huni's potential tombs. I'm about to ramble a bit, but it's the most important part of the episode, so listen up. First, there's the Layer Pyramid at the site of Zawiyat el Arian. Then there's Lepsius Pyramid 1 at Abu Roash. There's the Maidum Pyramid, Mastaba 17, also at Maidum, and a Mastaba in South Abu Sir, entitled AS 54. So starting with the Layer Pyramid, sitting just seven kilometers north of Saqqara, scholars like Rainier Stadelman have identified it as Huni's tomb because they believe that originally it was near complete, or even fully complete, and it must have taken a king with a long reign to get it that far. And Huni is thought to have reigned for 24 years because one king list, the Turin Canon, gives him 24 years on the throne. Otherwise, the Layer Pyramid is tenuously connected to an even more mysterious pharaoh named Kaaba, whose name was found on eight stone vases discovered in Amastaba just north of the pyramid. But there's a twist. It's possible that Kaaba and Huni are the same person because they're both different sorts of names. Huni is a prenomen written in a cartouche, while Kaaba is a Horus name written in something called a Serac, which is a little mini palace diagram. The very fact that Kaaba's name was found written on stone bowls might be evidence of this, because the practice of writing royal names constantly on stone bowls was very common in the first and second dynasties, but it didn't occur at all in the Third Dynasty, really, until the reign of Sneferu. So his name being on those bulls suggests that he's close in time to Sneferu, like Huni, of course. In addition, Kaaba's name has also been found at the upper Egyptian sites Huni was active at, but he's still generally seen as Huni's predecessor, so who knows. And contrary to the notion that the Layer Pyramid was nearly completed, it seems like it was abruptly abandoned, pretty close to the start of its construction. There was no trace of any casing blocks around it, and instead, there was a lot of mud brick masonry, which probably came from the ramps used to build what's left. The passages underneath it were also completely bare, and there was no trace of a burial, so whoever was intended to be buried there died so prematurely that the pyramid wasn't ready to take him in, in time for his funeral. Another structure identified as Huni's tomb is the Lepsius I pyramid, possibly the northernmost pyramid in all of Egypt. It's an enormous, shapeless mass of brick masonry located at the site of Abu Roash, just north of Giza. 
It has such an awkward name because it's named after Carl Richard Lepsius, who cataloged it during his 1842 expedition to Egypt. It was once 20 meters high, but by the mid 80s, when Egyptian Egyptologist Nabil Swellem investigated it, it had collapsed completely. Swellem also identified it as an enormous step pyramid from the third dynasty and attributed it to Huni. But there's a chance that it isn't even a pyramid at all. It's not in a dominant, elevated position in the landscape like most other pyramids, and in fact, it's within the Nile floodplain. About a quarter of its core is made up of a rock outcropping, which would have made construction much easier and cheaper, but this same rock outcropping is filled with dozens of tombs from the 5th and 6th dynasties. If it really was Huni's pyramid then, it would have had to have been totally destroyed within just a century of its construction to make way for these tombs which is very hard to believe, especially since Huni's memory wasn't erased like that of other pharaohs. Next we have the Maidum Pyramid, which is way bigger than all these other ones. Uh, it's usually attributed to Sneferu, but some think it was actually begun by Huni as a step pyramid and then finished by Sneferu as a true pyramid, although ultimately it collapsed. The problem with that is that Huni's name hasn't been found anywhere near it, while Sneferu's certainly has. The inscribed tombs surrounding it all belong to people connected to him, like his own sons, and graffiti praising him and his wife were found in the small mortuary temple just to the east of the pyramid. But there's another large structure at my tomb that might belong to Huni, although it might belong to any of Sneferu's predecessors. It's called Mastaba 17, and it's this huge mastaba right outside the pyramid itself. Whoever was buried there had to have been incredibly important given the enormity and the quality of the structure, its very close proximity to the Maidum Pyramid, and the rich burial once contained within, evidenced by tons of gold fragments being found within its burial chamber. And its burial chamber is actually grander than the one in the pyramid just next door. I mean, just look at how gargantuan these stones are. I mean, it's incredible. The mastaba itself over the burial chamber is made up of limestone chips from the construction of the pyramid, so it has to have been contemporary with the pyramid's construction. But the burial itself isn't actually connected to the exterior, so the burial had to have been made and filled before the mastaba was constructed. It may belong to any big cheese or prince, but there's a very real possibility that its occupant was a predecessor of Sneferu's. But unfortunately, no inscriptions were found within it. And in fact, the body discovered within its sarcophagus was destroyed during the Blitz because it eventually wound up in London. So the jury's out on that one. And finally, there's a large mastaba in South Abusir, numbered, or entitled, AS-54, which has been theorized to belong to Huni because his name was discovered within it. And it occupies a very prominent position within that cemetery. Additionally, a huge boat was found buried next to it in 2016, and in this time period, boats were almost exclusively buried next to kings. It's still generally considered to be the tomb of a high official, but a very important one at that. And the only name discovered in it so far is Hoonies. Either way, it's pretty interesting. But strangely, there do happen to be pyramids, plural, which are accepted to be Hoonies' handiwork, but aren't thought to be his tombs, and they're found across Egypt. You see, he built six small pyramids in Upper Egypt, at Zawiyat el Maitin, south of Baidos, Tuk, El Kula, near Hierakonpolis, South Edfu, and Elephantine. His successor Sneferu even built one of his own at Sela, near the Fayum. Huni's been identified as their builder mainly because a granite cone bearing his name was found right next to the one at Elephantine, which gives its name as the Diadem of Huni. Their purpose is hotly debated, and they may have been associated with royal estates or places devoted to the royal cult, or since there's one for each gnome in southern Upper Egypt, it might have been connected to the reorganization of provincial governments somehow. All these provincial pyramids might have actually lessened the significance of Huni's main pyramid, his actual tomb, so maybe that's why we haven't identified it yet. All in all, these grand structures and pyramids are good foreshadowing for the intense centralization of control needed to build 
the Pyramids of Giza. It's just a real shame hardly anyone put their names on them. Going back to the documentary, Ziri is shown excavating at a part of Saqqara known as the Bubastion. So let me give you a bit of context about what that is. The Bubastion is an area of Saqqara near its entrance that was once a sanctuary dedicated to the famous cat goddess Bastet. Her main cult center was the city of Bubastis in the Nile Delta, but she was also the patron of a nearby neighborhood of Memphis known as Ankh so she was known here as Bastet, the Lady of Anktawi. Hundreds of thousands of mummified cats and even sometimes lions were interred here in her honor during the late period, which is when the main tomb found here, shown in the documentary, dates to. The Bubastion is at the southern end of a huge ensemble of animal cemeteries known as the Sacred Animal Necropolis, where countless mummified dogs, ibises, falcons, baboons, and bulls were interred in huge catacombs, also mainly during the late period. It's been theorized that animal mummies were so popular then because by that point the Egyptians had been subjugated by Libyans, Kushites, Assyrians, and Persians. So they thought that their gods had sort of abandoned them. And because of that, they had an increased desire to appease them. Animal mummies were thought to intercede with their associated god on behalf of whoever had paid for them to be mummified, which is sort of ironic because this led to the slaughter of millions of animals for no real reason. Yeah, the idea that the Egyptians would put you to death for killing a cat or something is sort of a lie. I mean, they did it all the time, just so they could mummify them. It was also a uniquely Egyptian practice, and it was part of a trend of recalling Egypt's past golden ages. A cliff in the Bubastion is filled with countless amazingly well-decorated tombs from one of these golden ages, the New Kingdom, but ironically, these were all repurposed so they could store tons of cat mummies. The most notable of these has to be the beautifully decorated tomb of Maya, the wet nurse of King Tut, which was discovered in 1996 by a French mission that has been working at the Bubastion for decades. But now to what Waziri actually found. If you've watched the documentary, you'll remember that half of it was devoted to the amazing cash tomb he found, and for good reason. The documentary never got into specifics, but based on news articles released right after it was discovered in May of 2022, it contained 200 150 mummies in total and 150 bronze statues, which was apparently the largest ever collection of them found at Saqqara. It's been dated to the 5th century BC, so that would have been during the first period of Persian occupation, which also happens to be when Herodotus came by to visit. So one of those 250 mummies might very well have been a guy who saw Herodotus. Who knows? You know? Interesting to think about. Surprisingly, this isn't actually the first tomb of its type discovered by Waziri at the Bubastion. And in 2021, they found multiple after Waziri targeted the area where the French mission had dumped all of their debris from their excavations. But the star of the show wasn't any mummy or statue. It was actually an exceptionally well-preserved Book of the Dead, fully intact found within the sarcophagus of a man named Ahmos. Strangely, the papyrus's discovery wasn't actually announced until January of this year, and it wasn't physically unveiled at the Cairo Museum until February. It's written in hieratic, which is basically the cursive form of regular hieroglyphs, and it's composed of 150 columns accompanied by illustrations, which in total contain an impressive 113 chapters from the Book of the Dead. All in all, it's a whopping 16 meters long. The length and number of chapters within a given Book of the Dead depended on what its owner could afford. And Ahmos must have been ballin' because this one is pretty long. Some have even claimed that it's the second longest papyrus ever found, only coming second to Papyrus Harris I in the British Museum, which is a whopping 41 meters long. This isn't really true, though, since Another papyrus, also within the British Museum, the Greenfield Papyrus, which famously features this guy, is over 37 meters long. As shown in the documentary, the papyrus was named Waziri Papyrus 1 in honor of Waziri by his team, and although this might seem strange, it actually has a pretty long precedent. An important papyri like this one are usually named in honor of the people who were connected to them, but mainly in the past this was their owners. Just think of the papyri I just listed. Apparently there's already a Waziri Papyrus 2 in the works undergoing restoration, and it'll be unveiled at some unknown date in the future. 
Thank you so much for watching, and make sure to like and subscribe if you want more content on ancient Egypt and the mysteries of the ancient world. If you like this style of video over the other styles of videos I make, make sure to mention it in the comments. That would be very helpful. All right, see you soon.